Good morning, everyone. Thank you for tuning in and, and hearing about the case study we've got uh, for you prepared today. Um, so firstly, yeah, thank you for Wood Solutions and also uh, Connie for uh, having or well, going with XLAM on this particular job, uh, which was yeah certainly a great one to be a part of. Uh, so running through, through a few items today, so we're not going into too much technical detail, so we're looking to sort of cap it around the 20 minute mark. Uh, so we'll just run through some of the product details, the location, the extent of the CLT, uh, touch on the structural and the fire engineering solutions uh, that were undertaken, and the logistical solutions that were required for this particular, particular project, uh, and then touch on the installation, manufacturing, delivery, and then just a, a, a brief summary at the end. So the particular job we're looking at today, um, Connie will go through a bit more uh, in-depth detail around the selection of material and, and the like, but what we're looking at today is a, a six-story six building, uh, which is a, a class three, class six uh, mixed-use development uh, with 40 boutique hotel rooms on top of a concrete podium. So this overall building had an effective height of less than 25 metres and a type A fire resisting construction requirement. Uh, and a key point here that the FRL for the hotel section uh, was reduced from 90, 90, 90 down to the 60, 60, 60. And a quick acknowledgement here of uh, a few of the key players on the project. So certainly the builder, Alessi Design and Build, uh, M&G are the structural engineers. The fire engineer was Scientific Fire Services, Architect and Vision Group installer was Top Knot and XLAM, of course, the CLT supplier, uh, following probably around six months worth of early supplier involvement there. So as Lawrence alluded to, the project 202 Elizabeth Street uh, is very much on a main road in the centre of Sydney, with close proximity to Central Station, uh, for those that know Sydney quite well. And Elizabeth Street itself is very much a, a main thoroughfare, thoroughfare through the north, sort of north-south direction of the city. So this particular job, more or less boundary boundary construction on three sides of the project site. And unfortunately, due to, I guess, the, the nature of the site and the road out the front, actually no work zone was permitted to the street front. Here you see a Google Maps image of a particular job site we're talking about. Uh, in between those two trees there, you can see the hoarding and, and the, the access into the job site there. So next, we look at the extent of the CLT uh, for this particular job. Here we see a cross section through the main part of the build. You can see the level one concrete podium above the ground floor and all those blue walls that you see in this zone here level one through to five, floor and wall plates are all CLT. So here's some snapshots of the particular model that we developed for the project. So as I mentioned, predominantly CLT from the level one podium, floor walls and cores. So that's the stairwell and the lift shaft. Additional materials were some localized steel beams for some minor load transfers. And a part of the overall building system, we utilized a site fabricated LVL boundary wall, which utilized the uh, TBA Firefly approved uh, wall system using the NX board, which I'll, I'll briefly touch on again later on. And this particular job opted for a traditional roof frame. So LVL uh, framing and traditional roof sheeting over the top. So briefly going into the structural and fire engineering solutions. So as required, generally with mass timber buildings, the structural engineering certainly does take the lead from the parameters that are set out by the fire engineer. So this certainly extends to the FRL, of course. Uh, so as mentioned before, the F FRL for level one through to five achieved a rationalized FRL of 60, 60, 60, down from the generally required 90 minutes. So this was uh, undertaken, or well, this analysis and, and achievement was undertaken by scientific fire services uh, prior to the engineering uh, getting underway. Throughout the project, generally, there was a DTS approach of encapsulation of the CLT. Uh, so the XLAM certification and testing involved a single layer of 16 millimeter fire rate of plasterboard, 
and applied to both sides of the walls generally and also the underside of the floor plates. In certain locations on the project, we did look to expose the CLT as a feature. Uh, on the typical floors for the solar computer units, this involved in some of the units there, uh, as you can see highlighted in green, uh, single walls exposed to certain extents. And this meant that those particular walls actually were increasing thickness to allow for the charring uh, requirement to help assist with the FRL achievement. Uh, and also with the fixing and bracketry uh, located, we located those on both sides of the walls essentially to create a, a level of redundancy within those fixings. Um, if a fire did uh, get underway within one of those fire compartments. Also exposed timber involved the inside of the lift shaft and also the stairwell. So all the stairwells, as you'll see in some of Connie's photos uh, later on, uh, are all exposed, uh, the inside walls and the stair runs themselves, and as well as the lift shaft. So it should be noted that the sprinkler system and drenches and the like were actually installed within those elements as well to assist with exposing the timber. And as alluded to before, the boundary wall system, uh, it was a requirement to have a tested system to AS5113, which is the external wall rating. And for this instance here, we utilized, as mentioned before, the LVL framed site fabricated uh, frame. So what we what was undertaken here was uh, top knot the installer prefabricated 1200 millimeter wide elements uh, and they, they were pre-lined on deck with the breathable sarking, uh, a fire blanket, and then the non-combustible inex board to the external face. So obviously with boundary burner construction, we just had no access to the outside face of the building. So this system allowed all the, all the elements to be fixed and connected from the inside face. So through the LVL frame uh, and screwed through into the outside boards. So we just couldn't achieve that with the CLT, otherwise it would have been great to have these elements with the CLT as well. And some additional requirements here, of course, uh, floor and wall systems tested with uh, two AS1530.4 and also penetration fire stops and the like all of which XLAM had previously undertaken uh, a plethora of testing, uh, both of our panels and, and various different products. So all in all, for this particular job, uh, no additional testing was required to certify the project. So now we have the design parameter set by the fire engineer uh, and panel thicknesses utilized for the project are as follows. So generally for the floor with an encapsulated soffit, uh, we utilized a five layer 160 millimeter panel. The walls, when they were encapsulated 105 mil, where they were exposed, they were increased to 145 between the, between the rooms. And for the cores, we were able to achieve a 125 millimeter thick panel uh, going up. So they were uh, encapsulated on the outside face, but exposed on the inside. And the air stairs, as we call our stair product, uh, overall thickness of about 266 millimetres. So as briefly mentioned, this particular site essentially locked in on three on three sides and of course no work zone required or allowed out the front of the building. So it certainly becomes a logistical challenge to get our panels up on deck and the like. And of course, being a, a quite a, a key site within the city. Uh, the design itself looked to optimise the street frontage. So it, it was side to side as well. So um, taking advantage of that full street frontage with the design. So this then left only a zone to the rear of the block here where we could lift materials up above the podium slab. And with the crane placed within the lift shaft, um, the end result was that we could actually only lift panels to approximately 2.5 metres wide, 4.5 metres long through that rear penetration. So now the challenge essentially remains, you know, how do we easily and safely uh, deliver the materials to that location on the ground floor uh, to above the podium deck to be lifted? So Connie and the team, um, not so much XLAM in this instance, but certainly the project team as a whole came up with a quite an innovative solution to install a turntable onto the ground floor. So here you see the turntable 
actually overlaid the, the typical floor plate. Uh, so this is from above the podium, uh, but the, the turntable itself was applied onto the ground floor. So the diameter needed to be wide enough to allow for a small rigid truck to access the site. And here's a, just a, a very brief uh, animation of, excuse me, sorry. Just a, a quick note, sorry. The, the MNG and design and construction of the temporary state of the podium and temporary transfer truss over uh, to allow this to happen uh, is probably a topic for another uh, presentation it's, itself. So just a quick comment there, because it was uh, a bit of uh, structural gymnastics to make this happen at the end of the day. So here we see a, a very rudimentary animation of the floor of the panels coming in off the street. So the trucks would enter frontways, driving in direct off Elizabeth Street, driving directly onto the turntable. Take a bit of a 180 trip around on the, on the turntable and reverse back into position to the loading zone. So this then allowed our CLT panels and other materials to be lifted from that rear penetration. So now with our, our panel size there noted, two and a half to about four and a half meters. So what, what does that floor panel, uh, floor panelization look like? So here we see an overlay of the actual panelization of the typical floors onto the uh, architectural layout. So as you can see, quite a number of panels and ultimately the number of panels per floor for the floor plate that is, uh, was, was around 44 per level. So with a wall to wall distance of about 3.3, the room sizes were just too big to have a continuous panel. So we pre pretty much had each panel as a simply supported element between those walls. The penetrations themselves were very much processed off-site uh, where they could be. There was still a bit of uh, coordination to take place with some outlets that were caught on-site, but predominantly all the processing was done in our factory down at Wodonga. Now the green panels that you see here, they're actually H3, well, T3G plus H3 equivalent treated. Uh, so that, that signifies panels that are under the wet areas and also the balconies and accessible rooftops. So another key feature of the design was the sequencing of the panels and the subsetting of the panels to about 30, 40 mil to allow for set downs uh, in, the, in, the, in the actual structure itself. So Connie may touch on this later, but the, the topping and the so forth was mainly isolated to those set down areas to achieve falls for outlets. Now looking at our walls, so in this instance here, because we were restricted to a, a maximum width of about 2.5 metres and, and length of four and a half, we needed to have panels that went full height, so 2.9 metres floor to floor, and they were max, they were limited to approximately 2.5 metre width. Um, so for a job without any logistical restraints, uh, we could certainly provide a, product, a panel to site, you know, upwards of 12 metres up to 3.4 metres high. So there was some sacrifice on this particular job due to restraints, uh, about how many panels we needed to incorporate into the job. So number of wall panels, there were about 78 per floor, and that included the windows and lintels, window headers and the lintels that you see there on that little snapshot of the model. So the walls were panelized to minimize the visual grade also. Uh, so the way we manufacture, we, we, we uh, utilize a slightly different feedstock to achieve the visual panel. Uh, which obviously does come at a, at a very slight premium. So we needed to reduce those areas and we panelized the project accordingly to uh, re reduce that extra over. So service penetrations over the doors were also prefabricated and they were sized to a, a receive a standard size of a five kilo from TBA Firefly. And another key element of the XLM offering for this job, uh, the external walls were pre-lined with vapor permeable membrane and the joints were taped on site prior to the, the cladding going on. So that's the, the front and the rear elevations of the building. So looking at the manufacturing and, and ultimately the delivery of the CLT panels. So overall on this particular job, the CLT can, uh, was around 360 cubic metres of product. 
and the total number of panels supplied to site through XLAN was about 511. So that number of panels certainly includes the windows and lintels, as mentioned before. And that volume of timber uh, to suit the installation sequence and the like uh, was staggered, the manufacturing was staggered over about a six week period. So we certainly could have uh, produced this all at once. Um, at the time, I think we were doing a double shift in our facility, so we could certainly have manufactured it within a single week, but it just wouldn't have been uh, the right approach for this particular job. So we had that staggered approach. Uh, which meant we were able to achieve a just-in-time delivery uh, for the product, uh, thus minimising storage requirements both uh, at, at the factory end and also at the site end uh, where we, so we had no storage, but also at the top-knot uh, yard where they received our semi-trailer load deliveries. So for this particular job, we broke it up into nine full semi-trailer loads of deliveries. And as you can see at the bottom of the screen there, we had about 50 individual packs. So those smaller packs were the packs of panels that were individually delivered to site on a small semi-rigid trailer. Uh, and that was micromanaged by Top Knot out of their facility. So some benefits of, of this approach for this particular job, um, certainly the location of the Top Knot storage yard being at Mascot, uh, it allowed for easy access for our semi-trailer loads coming up from Wodonga and also allow for a quick turnaround time as uh, smaller packs were required on site. So for instance, um, as a guide, the, the estimation of the install rate would have been about the 20, 25 mark per day, uh, but quite on a, on a number of occasions, uh, Topman managed to achieve well over 30 panels per day installed uh, for this particular job. So relatively quick case study. Um, so I'll quickly just go through some summaries, summary points and, and benefits of the overall solution that we supplied. So a very quick note there, uh, XLAM CLT certainly provided a lessee design and build with a sustainable solution for a site that certainly was deemed undevelopable. The main benefits of the XLAM solution certainly included, uh, included that it was a prefabricated system uh, and this required or negated any requirement for the work zone out the front. Certainly one of the main benefits of mass timber construction uh, is a superstructure that is ultimately half the weight of a conventional concrete building. So this particular project resulted in huge savings for the groundworks uh, where we had our, our turntable. Also the transfer podium and also the strong back truss, which I alluded to earlier, which was on level one. So essentially that full height of 2.9 meter deep steel truss is picking up the load of the building over to transfer that over the uh, over the turntable. So reducing the overall mass of the building was certainly a key feature and benefit of building the mass timber. The carbon sequestered within the CLT for this particular job was in the order of 300 tonnes of CO2. So certainly a, a great sustainable credential for the project. The XLAM solution to the product certainly uh, uh, allowed a fully resolved certified system for the structural and fire compliance. So this, uh, as mentioned before, reduced any requirement for additional testing and also made the whole certification process much, much simpler. So I didn't quite go into it here, but uh, the extensive R&D on acoustics, uh, both floor and wall build-ups uh, that XLAM has undertaken, uh, along with some industry partners, uh, certainly allowed for that component of the building to be easily certified as well. And finally, last point here, the local supply of XLAM certainly assisted with the logistical challenges of the storage and sequencing of deliveries. So all in all, just a few dot points there of the main benefits of the CLT, uh, but generally, uh, as, as Connie will run through further as well, um, some great benefits and ultimately a, a, a really successful job on a very difficult site. Uh, so something that we're very thrilled to be a part of right from the get-go. So I'll quickly wrap up there, the, the short 20 minutes case study, uh, but please feel free to drop any, any questions in the chat box and also reach out uh, if you've got any other projects that yeah, you can do for excellent to be a part of. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. So 
I'm Connie, as I've been introduced from Alessia Design and Build, and we've designed and built the Clancy, which is at 202 to 210 Elizabeth Street, Surrey Hills. Just to start off with, I'll give you a bit of a history on how we acquired the site, how we were on the job, and uh, how the project started essentially. So the client that I work with, or one of my clients, is uh, Paul Fishman from Eight Hotels. We've been working together for 20 years so this site came up as a potential uh, site at the time it was approved as a boarding house uh, when we went to look at the site the main driver in even considering purchasing the site or acquiring the site was the logistic difficulty in actually building anything on this site so previous to us developing the site it has basically been sitting there undeveloped uh, there's been single story structures been used as a, a beer garden, but the site is a key site on Elizabeth Street, basically across the road from Central Station, and no one had come up with a solution for the site. So in looking at the site, the main factor was we had to build it from the inside. As Sean mentioned, no work zone, no potential from building from the street, road closures were impossible. Uh, it was We only utilised road closures to install the crane and also for the concrete pour on the transfer slab. But apart from that, it's all been built from the inside. We, In doing that, we had to install the turntable. So the turntable that you saw in the plan that Sean brought up is only there for construction. Once we've completed construction, the turntable will go. So basically the construction methodology was firstly driven by the logistics and then the construction methodology was developed and driven by the CLT solution. We looked at a few different prefab options. So we also looked at prefab concrete, uh, potentially Dinsel, a number of prefab solutions. I was always uh, in I was always pushing for the CLT because it's something that I am personally passionate about, mass timber construction, for sustainability, innovation, uh, just the customization that you have with a mass timber construction, you just don't have with other prefab uh, options. It's basically completely customizable because we were so restricted in what we could do. The panels had to be sized to work with our site. So it's not that the site could cater for the panels, the panels had to cater to us. Uh, so we got XLAM on fairly early on. Once we had decided to push forward with the CLT option, we got XLAM on early on and started working together on de developing a solution for the site. So first step was structural engineers and XLAM to, on a very basic level, just to make sure that it would even, it was even feasible. From there, once we realised that this was the way we were going to go, we then moved on to design development. A key thing is mass timber construction and CLT construction, whether it, whether it be a difficult site like ours or any mass timber construction, is for the efficiencies to be realised in using mass timber. And the efficiencies are mainly time. Uh, the design development has to be fully resolved before that first panel comes to site. Now that design development is across the board. So there has to be a fully resolved design. There's no D and C element that you, that you have when you're doing a mass timber construction because it goes together like a jigsaw puzzle. So there was six months of design development, which included consultation with brigade, fully resolved fire engineering, structural engineering, uh, Section J, energy efficiency, acoustic, all of those things need to be resolved because it's all, all those things are prefabbed. So six months, but then out of that six months of coordination with across the team, we then have a structure of six stories, including all load bearing walls, stairs, lift shaft that goes up, that went up in eight weeks. So we realised uh, the efficiencies because of all the hard work we did in, in resolving all the issues prior to those panels coming to site. So in developing this, the design, like Sean illustrated, the 3D model, the working drawings, the panelization of panels, the sizing of trucks, all those things were resolved and finalised before the first panel came onto site. Then each panel went in as per the 3D model. So it was it was definitely realised as per the 3D model. So as the panels came in, they were installed. Uh, 
Now, the team that worked on the site, and again, I stress that it's so critical to get early contractor involvement. So after DA, developing CC, developing design, services design, essential services design, uh, it has to all be done prior. So the team that we had, M&G, Envision, uh, Top Knot, who were the installers, Boss Engineering, who was the structural steel fabricator, uh, Design Confidence, uh, Acoustic Logic, uh, and Concise Certification, who were the PCAs. Critical to have that team working together to come up with a resolved design. Now, because we were landlocked, and as Sean also illustrated, we did have to utilise a boundary wall system that was tested with the CLT, uh, but could also provide for being able to build all from the inside as well. So it had to be, we couldn't get to the other side of the wall for waterproofing. We couldn't get to the other side of the wall for, you can see it there in that photo. You couldn't get to the other side of the wall for fire rating. So the Inex wall system that is tested with the TBO Firefly uh, fire blanket is the system that was used and uh, all prefabbed on site and then lifted with the crane. Now, with the crane, we only had the crane on site for the lifting of the CLT. So the crane went in, once the CLT was complete and we had lifted the roof members, we the crane was gone. So in terms of efficiencies, the efficiencies that you realise with the use of CLT is in time. Uh, prelims are reduced, the down to management, down to crane, but key thing, it all has to be resolved prior. Uh, as Sean said, also the structure. So this, the, the structure of the building is uh, piles. Then we've got slab on ground, block work walls, ground to first, core field, 140, and then transfer slab above that, CLT above that, including all internal load bearing walls. Uh, CLT floor panels span from wall to wall. So every wall internally is load bearing. The building is fully sprinkler protected, so deemed to satisfy generally throughout with encapsulation, but where we have the exposed CLT walls, it was an alternative solution and we had to illustrate from a structural perspective and a fire engineering perspective that the building wouldn't fail on failure of sprinklers and that what was, that's what was done for the brigade, but essentially the alternative solution was sprinkler protection, so additional wall wetting sprinklers on those elements. Uh, in terms of, uh, the, so then the key elements in terms of construction, we had to look at waterproofing, uh, energy efficiency, how those walls. So obviously the CLT has performed as a material, but to achieve acoustic, to achieve section J, it was all done through lining. So generally it was cavity, insulation, plasterboard, different solutions for boundary walls to intertenancy walls, all customized because we did, nothing is typical about this site and nothing is typical about our design. So we have the exposed timber in the fire stair, we have the exposed timber in the lift shaft. And again, those solutions are all alternative solutions in a very, very detailed fire engineering report uh, that uh, we, we managed to achieve everything we wanted to achieve. There was nothing that we sort of wanted from an aesthetic perspective or a construction perspective that we didn't achieve. It just uh, took the time to resolve. You can see in this picture the strong back that um, that Sean referred to. So that strong back is actually part of the temporary structure that we had to install to allow for the turntable to be installed. So the turntable is basically in the place in place of where the permanent structure needs to go. So that uh, strong back had to be installed to basically hold the slab up, so to speak. So the final point, which is one of the most important points, is sustainability. So as a sustainable product, obviously renewable timber, recyclable, but on top of that is the waste that's generated from the installation of the CLT is so minor. Like all, we've only got packaging. So the panels come to site, they're packaged, the packaging is removed, that is your waste. Uh, if you imagine if you'd been building in traditional in traditional concrete, whether it be block work, traditional concrete, dins or whatever it may be, the waste that is generated uh, in comparison to packaging from some so from some timber panels, there is no comparison. So from a sustainability perspective, and we did do a green star rating on the building. We did study on green star and 
we do achieve. Uh, the structure itself only gains a number of points. So we'd, we'd obviously get all the points on waste generation and on the structure itself. But just as a sustainable product, I really feel like there's nothing compares to, uh, to mass timber construction. Uh, so that's on the sustainability. Probably one final point is the facade treatments. So we want, we didn't want to do a, a one of the you know a cladding on the facade or one of the systems that generally are used. We couldn't leave it exposed because it is a hotel use and the class of building. So we did a brick facade. Again, that was a bespoke solution that again we achieved. So basically. What I'm trying to say is that with the XM and the mass timber construction, I feel like really anything is possible. You, you aren't restricted uh, due to the fact that you are using the timber construction. It just takes the time to resolve all those elements, bring them together from all perspectives, uh, engineering perspective, compliance perspective, aesthetic design, bringing all those things together. But really in terms of a building material, in the 20 years experience that I've had, it far outweighs in so many ways, in a multitude of ways, as a building material. Um, and that's it. Hope you enjoyed it and hope to speak to some of you soon. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Connie. We can, we can finish up just that little section with a quick um, time lapse, if you like. Yep. So just take you through the build process. Yeah, so this is the time lapse that we had. So you can see the concrete podium. And then as the building is going up, you can see how the panels are going in. And it's basically floors, walls, and internal walls, then perimeter walls as each floor goes up. All the facade walls are wrapped in Proctor wrap. They already come pre-wrapped. You can see the supports as the walls go in, as the floors go in, they can then come out. And then our roof was a traditional steel and timber frame roof uh, sheet which we on another CLT project, I would definitely look at potentially doing a full CLT lid as well. Uh, it's just something that when we were looking at it, thought we may have had more flexibility with the roof in terms of falls, et cetera, but definitely would look at doing a CLT lid on future projects as well. That was amazing. Thank, thank you very much, Connie. And, and thank you very much, Sean, as well um, for, for two really great presentations on what is a very, very interesting project. Um, so we, we're fortunate we do have a bit of time for some questions and it looks like we've got a lot of questions which have come <laughs> in um, over, the, uh, over the course of the presentation. Um, so I, I suppose, um, yeah, we, we might as well dive into them uh, if, if we're all okay. Uh, now the, the top, um, top question, uh, which we've received with the most upvotes, um, which uh, I believe, uh, Sean, you've said, you know, looking to answer is, uh, it, it might be a question for the fire engineer really, um, but how was the FRL able to be reduced from 90-90-90 to 60-60-60? Was it a, an alternate solution or a performance solution, as I know? It was, a, it was an alt sol. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So that obviously utilised the fire engineer, scientific fire services. And um, yeah, actually on, on this topic, because it is, it is a really interesting topic, you, you were saying um, that the, the design incorporated some of the, the, um, the approaches which are identified in the deemed to satisfy solution in the NCC being encapsulation of most of the timber. Um, you, you, there's obviously those other three main requirements of uh, the deemed to satisfy solution being sprinklers throughout the project, non-combustible insulation and cavity barriers where you have a, a vertical um, or an opportunity for fire to spread. Um, were any of those or all of those also utilised in the project? All of them. All of them. Yeah, cavity barriers on the facade as well as floor to floor with the Inex wall system. So Inchibat um, was used on the facade and on the wall to wall. Beautiful. Cool. Um, beautiful. And, and that's, that's 
really interesting. It's something which we're, we're well, we, we like to advise for, but a performance solution is obviously a great way to go, but you can always um, look to those, those guidelines in the National Construction Code. And if you can apply those throughout the project, uh, I think it can give make, make the fire engineer's job a bit easier, certainly. Well, um, the, the thing with Sean and XLAM is that they already have all these systems tested. So they already have the wall system, the index tested with the TBA Firefly product. So it's, you don't have to go and reinvent anything. They've already done it all for you. And that includes the multi-service blocks to, for the penetrations into from the corridors to rooms for services um, all those things are tested because that is so critical already you're doing something that is a completely different construction methodology than traditional and then to then on top of that have to go and have things tested or try and uh, find things on your of your own accord to make sure that things work XLAM have those solutions for you. They've got a list of all their tested systems and they've got a solution. For my job, what I found is they had a solution for everything. Um, the only thing that we had to get, uh, had to sort of get creative with, and because I've done so much lightweight construction and timber construction, it was something that I've done before, is the fire doors. So the fire, sorry, not the fire doors, the lift doors being fire rated. So the lift doors to date are all tested in a masonry or traditional sort of system. XLAM at the moment, and Sean can talk about it, they're testing them at the moment, but that is just something that we had to come up with. Um, it was just an old soul, so it was nothing crazy. There was no testing, but absolutely everything else, XLAM had a solution for us. They were actually due to burn some fire doors this month. So that's yeah. exciting. <laughs> Good, so that, that's on its way. Yeah, and then, we get excited about some strange Yeah. And, you know, further to Connie's point, um, and as I'm sure a lot of the viewers probably saw just a, a fortnight ago, I think uh, our head of design, Nick Hewson, uh, went into a whole range of different elements and components that we've been burning up over the last few months and years. So, yeah, certainly always ongoing and there's always something new to, to put, put to the flame. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so our next question is from another anonymous attendee uh, and it's been upgraded a couple of times. So it looks like it's a popular one. Um, essentially saying that it looks like many of the design solutions uh, have depended on um, uh, previously performed R&D by XLAM, obviously, it's what we've just been talking about. Um, what level of design was provided uh, by M&G to XLAM for the project? and? Uh, is XLAM looking to be responsible for early designs in, in the future? Yeah, sure. So when we when we start looking at a project, uh, we we basically just utilise our span tables, be it either structural span tables, and then tie that in with our, our actually fire rated span tables, certified assessment reports. Uh, so that helps us generate our, I guess, early stage concepts and, and helps out with estimates and budgets. And from that point, um, for jobs like this, yeah, we M and G really did take the, the lead on the structural engineering from that point around the fixings and connections, and and tying it into the overall superstructure. So that's that's been the typical approach for most CLT projects that we've been a part of. Um, mm. With that said, we certainly do have in-house engineering within XLAM, uh, but it's a relatively small crew, so we are quite selective as, as to what projects we take on. Mm. Um, but I think that kind of answers the question. Last yeah. point there is XLAM looking to be responsible for early design. In future projects, I suppose tying back to that comment in the early stage, we're happy to, to do concepts and, and things like that to help set budgets and, and get the job on the right track. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it makes makes absolute sense. So um, thank you. Uh, so maybe maybe Connie, a good one. Um, looking at the, the construction sort of process uh, with timber, um, but looking from a weather protection point of view, um, what, what was your experience there from, um, you know, building with an exposed natural product, uh, I suppose, um, and, you know, what was it protected from the weather in, in any way? I, I saw obviously you had that um, the self-adhesive um, vapour permeable membrane, which was used. Um, yeah. Did you have to do anything else? We had, so facade wall, so there's treated and untreated, as Sean showed before. We treated all the external facade, we treated the lift shaft and we treated the walls in the stairs, in the um, shaft for the stairs. What I would do in future, if you weren't doing a CLT lid, so if you had a CLT lid, then the building is completely enclosed to the end of the CLT being lifted because we had a traditional roof. What I would do 
in future is treat the floor panels of the upper floor because we did have some water coming in um, and those floor panels weren't treated. Not that it became a huge problem because it didn't, but I would just do that in future. And I would also treat the panels that are on out. We've got a transfer on level four where we've got terraces. I would also treat those panels. So it's just a matter of, you know, those things that you learn along the way. Uh, so there's just more panels that we would treat for weather, for water. And uh, apart from that, no, just, you know, closing penetrations, just typical construction stuff. Like it's not, it's not unique to CLT because uh, water coming in when you've got windows that aren't installed yet is, a, is an issue with all construction. So not unique to CLT. Probably the only other issue that is tricky because you have to encapsulate all bases of CLT, including reveals to windows, you have to line them with fire check. Fire check, if you get water resistant fire check, it's not really water resistant. If it's in there for a period of time, it will get moldy. Uh, so it's, it's a matter of uh, sequencing. So you wouldn't line those reveals before the windows were going in because it will be sitting there for a while and you could potentially have what it is. But apart from that, no, we, um, yeah, that was the extent of it. Mm. Yeah, that really, really good comprehensive answer. Thank you. Um, so I suppose keeping along this sort of wet weather protection sort of theme and moisture most specifically, uh, often a, a question we receive questions around, um, it, talking about wet areas um, and, uh, you know, potential wall and floor junctions, probably we can talk about wet areas and tanking first. Uh, what was your solution in those spaces? Uh, did you have a set down or a hob or... Um, yeah, yeah. So we had what we could, what with our hotel rooms, um, we don't like to have a step up into the bathroom. So a lot of people have a step up into the bathroom because they've got their floor built up, their screen, their tile, etc. We don't like to do that. So as Sean showed earlier, we had set downs in our floors to allow for the floor build up of 45 mil. So that floor package for the bathroom had so the CLT was treated. Then on top of that was villa board. Then on top of that for acoustics, we had vibromat and then screed. Now below the screed, we do the waterproofing, which is then turned up at the corners. Then on top of the screed, we do hydropoxy. So on top of that substrate of, uh, now the vibromat is for acoustics. So depending on the class of building, you may not need the vibromat, but the waterproofing element is the villa board going down first to give you a substrate for the waterproofing to stick to. Beautiful, uh, that's great, thank you. Uh, so we might move away from this topic a little bit just because we've spent a bit of time on it and obviously there's a, there's a lot of other questions, many other questions we can we can talk about. Um, uh, we've, I've seen a, a couple of different people um, asking around the floor-to-floor -floor height uh, and then also the finished floor-to-ceiling height uh, and, you know, the services zone, I suppose. Is there a lot of room for services um, and uh, how have they been reticulated? Uh, would you know that um, just off the top of your head? Yeah, so floor, um, top of floor to underside, so top of timber to under timber, 2.9. Uh, in the rooms, because you, the acoustics, so you have to line, deem to satisfy, everything has to be lined in fire check, including the underside of floor panels. Uh, so you've got that, then you've got 150 mil cavity under that, which is for acoustic separation. And then you have your suspended ceiling below that. So from 2.9, we out in the rooms, because then obviously you've got your floor build up as well. We achieved 2530 in the rooms, in the corridors, 2300. Um, and in the bathrooms, it varied only because our fan core units are in those bathrooms. So they went from 2.2 to 2.3, depending on reticulation of services. So generally 2530 in the rooms, 2300 in corridors. Beautiful. Great, thank you. So uh, Ethan Jones has a, a question which I think is relevant to both of you, um, asking about BIM, uh, Building Information Modelling, and, and whether it was involved in design development due to the complexity of the design. Um, obviously, Sean, you, you showed some uh, screenshots of uh, a, a model. Um, it would be really interested to hear about um, the, the level of detail that that model is taken to, its, its importance in the project. And then, then Connie, um, you know, if... Uh, if that has helped with the buildability, I suppose, of the project. So maybe starting with Sean, just to talk about the supply side. Yeah, sure. From a supply point of view, um, the way we operate, we, we don't necessarily get into the BIM modeling uh, until we 
uh, officially engaged as a part of the project. Uh, so that's very much part of the shop drawing process. So those models that I showed in, our, in my slide there were the XLAM shop drawing models. Uh, so we, we obviously model that down to the millimetre because uh, we need to obviously detail all the half lap joints, uh, the one or three millimetre tolerances, the running dimensions between panels and things like that. Uh, so that's that's the three D model that we get involved with. Um, prior to that, um, Connie, I'm not exactly sure what uh, extent the BIM was used prior to us getting involved. Sorry, but uh, you might have some comment there, Connie. So uh, prior to XM being involved, the it, with it, resolving the cross laminated timber and resolving the mass timber construction, the model is absolutely critical. Prior to that, no, we hadn't really used the BIM, BIM modeling in. It was all planned. Yes, we had 3D, but it was more through Revit. We used the model, but the model that we then used with XLAM is absolutely critical because we literally sat together with Tyson that works with Sean, who's their, their project manager, going through every single panel and how those panels will work, how they would get installed, if there were any details we needed to change, absolutely critical. And we did that three or four times prior to sign off. Uh, and then on site, you use that model to install. Mm -hmm. So top knot and their boys on site literally had ipads with the model they knew what was being delivered and it was it was actually quite amazing because you have this 3d model of the building which each, with each panel sequentially numbered the panels arrive in that order and they go in as per the model so from that perspective it's absolutely critical hmm. yeah so generally speaking with, with this type of job with a, a flat constant soffit um I guess from our point of view, it's not as critical. Certainly when you go to a post and beam office where you've got uh, penetrations through beams and services to coordinate, yeah, probably early, earlier on mm. um, prior to the, you know, the XLAM involvement would certainly be suggested for, for a BIM mm. model. It depends on your job as to when you might want to kick it in. Um, so I suppose continuing on with, uh, I guess, that buildability theme and the actual construction process, um, Connie, David, David Fletcher has asked a couple of questions around the actual program time of, of the project, uh, of, the, of the timber section of the project, and uh, the number of people who were, who were working on it for the installation um, point of view. Uh, would you have any of those figures at the tip of your tongue? Yep. So timber on site, so from when the first panel was delivered to last panel being installed was eight weeks. So six stories, eight weeks, but that includes the stairs, uh, fire stair, lift shaft. Keep in mind every single wall internally is load bearing. And that also includes the inex walls. So the perimeter walls. So the perimeter walls, you know, have to go in obviously for the building, but that wasn't uh, the CLT itself. So eight weeks, six stories, including the inex. Uh, we had 10 to 12 carpenters on site a day doing the install because we're really working. It ended up being over two floors because you install your walls and then you put your your um, support in and then the floor goes on. Then those supports come out and brackets are fitted off. So after the first level of wall goes in and you've got your first floor and you've really got teams working on uh, two floors. Uh, and then my site foreman, project manager, and me. Beautiful. So pretty small team. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> good, good to hear, uh, especially on a, a confined site or constrained site like this. Um, beautiful. Well, look, I, I think that's that's just about all we've got time for today. So so thank you so much, both Connie and Sean, uh, for your, your time this morning. It's been an absolute pleasure to hear of your experiences uh, with this project and, and we really look forward to seeing you both uh, go on to you know deliver many more <laughs> mid-rise timber projects in the future um, so please everyone who's who's uh, attending the meeting please show your gratitude in the chat um, feel free to uh, leave um, yeah, your, your messages of gratitude there um, and uh, we'll we'll um, leave you both to it uh, for the rest of the day. Let you get back to your busy schedules, um, and I'll just finish up with a few of the, the admin things in the last couple of minutes. So thank you very much. Thank you, Lars. Thank you. Okay, thank so uh, once again, thank you very much to both Sean and Connie. Um, so as we covered off earlier in the uh, the webinar, which I, I hope you enjoyed. Um, we will be sending an email around um, with a survey, which you can fill out with your CPD questions. Uh, obviously, there's those three questions which uh, we identified earlier on. 
uh, and I think we can note in a second as well. Um, and uh, yeah, just as I said earlier, please make sure that you uh, download and store this form the first time you get it, uh, because we won't be reissuing it. So um, just keep that one in mind. Uh, other resources that Wood Solutions has, um, you may be aware of our uh, relatively new um, YouTube series uh, called Wood Solutions in Focus, which sort of takes you behind the scenes uh, in a lot of the, uh, the timber supply chain and looks in a bit of detail, in, in a bit of focus, I should say, um, at, at design questions. So as you can see here, we've got a few on CLT actually going out to XLAM, uh, but we've also got LVL uh, uh, where we've got how sawn timber is uh, produced and, and then we started looking at design as well. So this is an ongoing uh, sort of campaign which we worked on for a while. Um, so next week, next Thursday, we have another great mid-rise uh, presentation from a structural engineer at Rutherblast, who you may know as being uh, one of the, the biggest um, producers of uh, connectors and, and acoustic products and uh, waterproofing products and a broad range of different sort of accessory products in these timber projects um, who are based in Italy. Uh, but we're very fortunate to have Matteo joining us. Um, it's the topic, as you can see, is on waterproofing and air tightness designed for timber buildings. Uh, and that will be running on next Thursday at 11 a.m. So make sure you register for that uh, as soon as you can. Um, also, don't forget, of course, the, the typical standard wood solutions weekly webinars are continuing to happen on Tuesday mornings as well. Um, so if you're, if you're enjoying these, make sure to sign up for both uh, the Tuesday and Thursday sessions. Um, just keeping in mind that the, th the Thursday session is really focusing on this mid-rise sort of space. And that's us. So thank you very much to everyone for joining us uh, today for this webinar. Uh, I really hope you enjoyed it. I know I certainly did. And uh, we really look forward to seeing you in the next one. We'll see you next time. Bye.